<clears throat> Hello everyone, thank you for joining us for another video. Um, the other week I started receiving some comments from people saying that Nathan Oakley, a prominent and rather vocal flat earther, had covered one of my videos in his live stream and apparently destroyed it. So I went ahead and watched Nathan's stream, and today we're going to pick apart his arguments. Now, the original video of mine that Nathan is referring to is one I entitled How to Silence a Flat Earther. A triggering title, I will admit, but it came about because I challenged numerous people in the comments of my other videos to explain how the observations that we can make of the moon are able to conform to any flat earth idea. And all of them went quiet, hence how to silence a flat earther. So my video was actually an attempt to make the observations of the moon fit to a flat earth and then explain why it didn't work. So I started by stating the characteristics of what we can observe about the moon and then tried to make them fit a flat earth. I'm not entirely convinced if Nathan completely understood this to begin with because he continuously tries to argue points based on the concepts of a globe in his usual charming manner. My God, this guy is thick. I ask people like you, Bonehead. No, you don't, do you, Dumbo? Because you're dumb, lazy bastard. Oh, this guy's a complete monk. Probably wasn't helped by his apparent inability to allow any video to play for more than two sentences before he pauses it to try and rant off a debunk and throw out some insults. So the first observation that I'd stated was that the moon is a sphere, although my initial wording was round. So round is flat. Round is two-dimensional. Your description is flat. Except the definition of the word round is to be shaped like a circle, cylinder, or a sphere. Yes, using the word sphere or ball would have been less ambiguous, but the word round still applies to 3D shapes, so not off to a great start. Now, I will hold my hands up. In my original video, I'd put forward that flat earthers agree that the moon is a sphere. At that point, I'd never had a flat earther claim that the moon was anything other than spherical. Since then, though, people have pointed out that actually there are flat earthers that argue that the moon is also flat. Nathan himself states that we can't say what shape the moon actually is, and that my statements that we can tell that the moon is a sphere by looking at the shadows are actually false. Now, he says he's observed the moon extensively over many years using a telescope and claims that I've never, ever even looked at the moon. Damn, he's rumbled me. I've never bothered looking at it at all. There are actually a few characteristics that we can observe with a telescope that shows that the moon is spherical. You can see what resembles to be impact craters all over the surface. Now, the ones in the mid-frame of the moon always appear pretty circular, whilst the ones heading out towards the edges get gradually more and more oval. Now, that points to either a sphere that's covered in circles and their apparent shape is changing due to perspective, or the moon is, say, flat, and it just so happens that it's all circles in the middle and ovals at the edge. But the moon goes through libration, which is the apparent wobble of it, which I showed in a time-lapse video that Nathan just dismissed as being CGI. You know, that isn't how it appears to us. You know, what he's doing is showing a time-lapse over a prolonged period that's probably been created in a CGI program. Even though there are multiple examples of time lapses available, all showing the same thing. So our perspective of the moon actually changes slightly at different times of the year. And when this happens, the apparent shape of those impact craters changes. Yet they don't move relative to each other and the overall outer edge of the moon shape remains circular. Then Nathan at one point alluded to the moon being a light in the sky. Now, I've seen people suggest that the moon is, in fact, its own light source, almost like a miniature sun. I don't know if that's what Nathan was inferring to or not, but just to be sure, the impact craters have shadows in them. You cannot get solid black shadows on a light source because the light source illuminates them. So the moon itself cannot physically be a light source. Its light has to be a reflection from a different source which I'd stated was the sun. Nathan disputed that because it's a globe model. Oh, really? So maybe you want to look into specular reflections and how your heliocentric moon is claimed to be lit by the sun, to know that it isn't. But those shadows not only change with the moon's phases, but if you look at, say, a half moon, 
The moon's craters near the Terminator line have clearly defined deep shadows in them, whereas the craters away from the Terminator line don't. And those shadows again change relative to each other throughout the lunar phases, yet the size and the location of the craters relative to each other doesn't change. Now, I'd be interested to see Nathan show us any shape that isn't curved, which has perspective shifts and shadow behavior like that. I should probably also point out to Nathan as well that the image that I used, which clearly shows the moon remains circular even in the shadow area, isn't some fake CGI artist rendering like he claims. Has anybody ever seen this clean Terminator line? Like this? This doesn't look like a picture of the moon. This looks like an artist rendering from a weird angle with a strange Terminator line. It's actually a HDR photograph that I took in 2020 during COVID lockdown. I was following a tutorial by Alan Wallace, who's a renowned astrophotographer, and I'll leave a link to that tutorial in the description below, so if you want to go and see how it's done, you can. But with a decent censored camera, not like a Nikon P1000, it's fairly easy to see the outline of the shadow side of the moon, especially when the moon's not mostly illuminated. Either way, all of that doesn't really matter regardless of whether the moon is flat, spherical, or any other shape, the other observations still hit the same problems. Now, observations two and three I made seem to confuse Nathan, possibly again due to his spamming of the pause button. Observation two. At any given time of the year, from anywhere in the world, the moon always appears the same size. Now, the moon appears the same size, like apparent. Apparent size appears apparent. Yeah, so what? Observation three is that from any spot on the Earth, you watch the moon through the night, it will always stay the same size from your vantage point. Isn't this the same as point two? So your crap point about apparent size of the moon, point two was concluded, moving on to point three, apparent size of the moon. The orbital distances vary throughout the year with around a 13% range between its closest and farthest distances. And we'll come back to that shortly. But on any given night, the moon's size appears the same from everywhere on Earth. You never fly to a different country on holiday and think, damn, the moon always looks so much bigger from here. Now, in the heliocentric model, there is a slight variation in the relative distance, depending on our vantage point relative to the moon's position in the sky, because of the radius of the Earth. So if the moon were exactly 250,000 miles away when it's directly above us, then it would be just shy of 254,000 miles away at the horizon. But that's only a 1.6% variation, which is too small for us to perceive by eye. So the moon's size appears to be the same throughout the night from your single vantage point. That's not the same as observation two. Observation two is the apparent size from multiple vantage points, and observation three is from a single vantage point throughout a night. Now, those combined means you could have several people positioned along the path of the moon, and each could watch the moon rise, pass overhead, and down to the horizon on the other side, and it would appear the same to all of them, which is only happening on a flat Earth if the relative distance of the moon to each of the observers doesn't change by a perceivable amount, and it's similar distances for all of them. So if you've got 8,000 miles between the first and last observer, you would need the moon to be hundreds of thousands of miles above a flat Earth for the relative distances to not change much between each of the observers. Which brings us on to the moon's altitude. Now, I'd stated a figure of 3,000 miles for the moon's height above a flat Earth, because that's the general rough figure that I've seen flat Earthers use whenever they've actually been prepared to put a figure to it. No, we do not. I do not make that claim. So, no, definitely not. We wouldn't make that assertion. It's stupid to make such an assertion when you understand what the stars do. Except at about the same time that Nathan published that particular live stream, Eric Dubay, another prominent vocal flat earther, was publishing a video all about the flat earth in which he states, The astronomers now teach that the sun's distance from the earth is from 92 to 93 million miles, whereas it is proved to be under 2,400 miles, and the stars and planets even less than that. And Nathan doesn't provide even a hint of what sort of distance the moon actually is. 
So we can categorically state what distance is it's not, but doesn't have a vague idea of even roughly what distance it is. Now, he repeatedly claims you can't measure the distance to the moon without an R value. You will need an R value, and we have debunked it. He says he's debunked things quite a lot, but never actually gives any details of what the debunk is. Except the R value is only required if you're ranging a moon by measuring its parallax on a globe. Because you have to use trigonometry to calculate the length of the sides of the triangle, but the distance between the two points on a globe is curved, so you need to work out the length of the straight line between the two vantage points, as well as working out what that extra piece of angle is rather than just the elevation angle that we can see. Calculating that baseline requires an R value. But there are other ways to measure the distance between two points on a globe without an R value, such as laser measuring, radio and radar, which have all been used and are still used today for measuring the distance to the moon. Parallax measuring with an R value was just what was done centuries ago to first try and calculate the distance of the moon based on the concept of a globe with a radius of about 4,000 miles. But let's just say for a moment here that Nathan has debunked the R value, that it doesn't exist and that we do actually live on a flat Earth. We can still use parallax to measure distances. Trigonometry doesn't require an R value. The R value is only there to take the figures from a globe model and transpose them into a triangle. You can measure any distance with parallax provided you have a long enough baseline. So with a completely flat Earth, if the moon is too far away that parallax measuring can't work with that, then that gives us a pretty good indication as to the moon has to be a pretty far distance away. And measuring a parallax on a flat Earth is even easier than on a globe. Because you've no R value to worry about, those parallax calculations become easier. The flat Earth creates a perfect baseline. There are lots of examples online of people who've used these parallax measuring techniques themselves on the moon, and they've used the formulas that are based on a globe. So out of interest, I took their data, but reworked it to ignore the R value, given that the distances between the observers across the surface of the Earth wouldn't change, the elevation angles for the stars and the moon that we observe would still remain the same, and I got a measurable distance for the moon above a flat Earth of about 165,000 miles. And his refute to my point that the orientation of the moon's face varies depending on your latitude? But depending on your flat Earth elevation angle measurement to Polaris, it changes its orientation. No, I've observed it. What it does, depending on position, or time if you stay still, how long you wait for it to move through the sky, it rolls. So the moon is now cartwheeling across the sky. If I may quote Nathan on this claim... Appears apparent. Look up apparent, bonehead. Hang on. <clears throat> It appears to roll. Apparent. It rises in the east in one orientation, and we see it set in the west in another orientation. But it's a presumption to say that it's the moon that's rolling rather than us. Especially given that its orientation to the surrounding stars doesn't change either. But to someone who's west of us, seeing the moon rise from their vantage point at the exact same moment in time that we're seeing it set, they don't see the same orientation that we're seeing they will see it rise from their vantage point in the same orientation that we saw it rise from ours. And if you take three vantage points along a straight north-south line, say North, Central and South America, all three vantage points can view the moon at exactly the same time, yet all three will see different orientations. That is nothing to do with the moon physically rolling. That comes down to perspective and the apparent lack of distortion in the shape of the moon from such changing perspective further validates that the moon must be a very far distance away from the Earth. Now, my personal favourite moment is when he attempted to refute my statement about the apparent sizes of the moon not changing by using an image demonstrating that the moon's size does appear to change as its orbital distance changes. So the moon should actually change in size quite drastically. It should start very small. Right, but there he's described that it should be getting bigger and smaller. It's like, no, it does actually get bigger and smaller. Right? We can actually show that. Now, the image that Nathan is displaying here as proof of his argument is showing the apogee and the perigee of the moon. Firstly, my claims were that the apparent size doesn't change over the period of one night. The image he's showing are clearly dated five months apart, 
and they happen to state that the measured distances of the moon are well over 200,000 miles. Apogee and perigee are definitions in orbital mechanics to describe the closest and farthest points of an object's orbit around the Earth. So Nathan's now using globe mechanics as evidence to try and dispute my point when my point is trying to make the observations of the moon fit a flat Earth. Isn't this supposed to be my video he's destroying here? I sure hope he hasn't had any rants at me for using globe mechanics when trying to explain a flat Earth. That would be embarrassing. Year as its orbit gets maybe a bit closer. But orbit? What? You're just assuming orbits? Moving your hand around? Is that your proof, see? Is this moving your hand around a proof C of an orbit? No, no, we debunked it. It needs an R-value assumption. <laughs> a flat projection of a globe projection of a flat Earth angle measurement to Polaris with latitude. That's what you've actually got here. Not that you know any of that. You just say flat Earth model. It isn't. It's using latitude, the principle that's come from a flat Earth, to give you an excuse to have a flat map. So you can say it's a globe projection. Oh. Thanks for that explanation, Nathan. Do you know, I'd often wondered why whenever I use this equatorial mount with my camera to photograph the night sky, I always have to set the elevation of it to exactly whatever my latitude is at where I am at the time. And then I have to look through the scope in it that runs right through the middle and reference it against this little app called Polaris View that tells me where to put Polaris in the viewfinder relative to the center crosshair. It always tells anyone using it in the Northern Hemisphere to line it up perfectly with where the presupposed spherical Earth model's axis of rotation happens to be. And if you use it in the Southern Hemisphere, you have to point it south from your position, nowhere near Polaris, and again, always happens to fall in line perfectly with the presupposed spherical Earth model's axis of rotation. And remarkably, whenever I do that, the stars then stay fixed relative to my camera and I can do really long exposures. That's odd. So you're saying that the latitude lines all across Earth are people's measurement to Polaris, that whatever latitude they're at, that's where Polaris will be in the sky for them. So if you're at 90 degrees north latitude, is the North Pole because Polaris is directly 90 degrees above you. Makes sense. And then if you go to a 50 degree latitude-ish, that puts you somewhere around, say, northern Canada, northern Europe, round in, say, Russia. And at that latitude line, then Polaris will appear 50 degrees in the sky above the horizon to the north for everyone. And then zero degrees is the equator. So if you're in Colombia or the Congo or Malaysia, Polaris appears at zero degrees above a flat plane to all of them. Good to know. What do the latitude lines south of the equator mean? I'm just curious as to how people in New Zealand would know that for them, the elevation angle of Polaris is 45 degrees through the floor of a flat Earth, and yet it's 50 odd degrees in the sky for me. I'm sure the answer will be celestial navigation works, so you're dumb. And then he decides to just go into a full-blown meltdown. Side, I'm seeing a completely different face of it. Yeah, something that doesn't happen. But what if it was a sphere, we'd see the backside of it. So you are essentially debunking the heliocentric moon climb then. This is a ball, Nathan. Clearly, definitely three-dimensional, and there is a reference point so that you can validate its orientation. And, well, look, I can orbit this around me with it rotating once per orbit, just like the heliocentric model, and wouldn't you know it, I can only ever see the one face, never the backside. Who'd have thought? All the popular flat Earth ideas seem to state that the moon circles above a flat plane, staying a constant altitude above it. Actual altitude apparently unknown, but that would prevent it from ever reaching the horizon. The only way that you would see it go below the horizon of a flat Earth is if it actually went below the flat Earth. Yet it's always visible from somewhere on Earth at any one point. And despite it making such transits right across our field of view, its apparent shape doesn't change, regardless of where we view it from. 
So perhaps Nathan could demonstrate to everyone any shape or distance for a moon above a flat plane that mimics those observations from multiple vantage points. I highly doubt it, given that through the entirety of this 90 minute rant stream he provides no diagrams, no details, not even a suggestion of how the moon's observations could be possible from multiple vantage points on any flat plane, which is what would have actually been required to debunk my video. The one and only argument he seems to be able to put forward at all for a flat Earth, which he clings to like a life raft throughout the entire stream, is celestial navigation. When the guy tells the captain which f***ing way to point the boat after using a sextant and measuring angles from a flat plane, do you think it shouldn't be the case that he should be allowed to tell the captain which direction to point the boat in? Except the thing is that Nathan has clearly researched all of this in depth. He's He's gone through celestial navigation in detail. So Nathan knows that you don't just take a sextant and measure the angle from the horizon to a celestial object. So you take the measurement with the sextant and then you apply some corrections. And one of those corrections is called dip correction, which is to take your perspective from your vantage point and traverse that into a flat plane that is perpendicular to where you're standing. And there are charts with all of the relevant dip correction values that you have to put in based on your altitude. Except those figures are derived from a formula that uses an Earth radius value of 3959 miles. Planner Walk addressed this to Nathan months ago in one of his videos in response to being called out about it. He made a calculator that had the formula which included an Earth's radius of 3959 miles and plugged in various observer heights and the dip correction values that he got out of that pretty much exactly matched the official dip calculation values that is used in celestial navigation. So if the Earth doesn't have a radius of 3959 miles, then those dip correction values that are being used in celestial navigation are wrong, and so celestial navigation shouldn't work. But Nathan repeatedly states that it does. It's a huge mistake to theorize before one has data. Inevitably, one begins to twist facts to shoot theories instead of theories to shoot facts. He's concluded that celestial navigation proves irrefutably that the Earth is flat, so therefore every other observation must somehow be possible on a flat plane, even though he can provide no explanation as to remotely how that would be possible. And then just chucks out insults left, right and centre as though that somehow constitutes evidence. I mean, I could have made a video like that. I could have just filled this with statements like, ooh, I'm a bit concerned about putting a, a photo of Nathan in my thumbnail because YouTube doesn't like you using pictures of penises. Or what's the difference between Nathan Oakley and a septic tank? A septic tank doesn't talk as much. Anyway, I think that's probably enough for this video. Feel free to leave your thoughts in the comments down below. While you're down there, if you enjoyed this video and you haven't already done so, then please consider hitting the like and subscribe button. If you'd like to help support the channel further, there is also a link to my Patreon account as well. And then hopefully we'll see you in the next video.